I'm delighted to introduce Professor Nikki Marsh from the University of Southampton. Nikki's research covers late 20th and 21st century British and American literatures, theories of gender, postmodernism, poetics, and economics. She's the author of Money, Speculation, and Finance in Contemporary British Fiction, Democracy in Contemporary US Women's Poetry, and she's also the co editor with Paul Crosswaite and with Peter Knight, who is speaking later today of a book called Show Me the Money, The Image of Finance, 1700 to the Present. She's also editor with Liam Connell of Literature and Globalisation, a reader. So today she will be talking about the book Show Me the Money and the AHRC-funded project of the same name with Peter Knight and Paul Crosthwaite. The project charts how the financial world has been imagined in art, illustration, photography and other visual media over the last three centuries in Britain and the US. So join me in welcoming Nikki. Thank you. And I have, actually, I'd like to also thank um, Andrew and Katie for inviting me because it feels very indulgent to be given so much time to talk about the whole, the whole exhibition because it's been an important part of my life in the last two years and I haven't brought it together yet. So it's very exciting to be able to kind of do this overview and be able to kind of publicly, publicly share that. So thank you for that. Um, what I'm going to do, so this is a poster, I'm going to end up by talking about this image. This is an image by um, the artist Molly Crabapple, who emerged, according to, I can't point to his book anymore, according to Paul Mason, as one of the artists of Occupy, and Paul Mason made her um, his person of, 20, of 2011, I think. Um, I'm going to end up by talking, with, uh, talking about that. This is a poster that was used to advertise the uh, exhibition when it was in Southampton. So the exhibition is, I'm going to give us, give you a kind of, general sense of why we did it and the argument that it's behind it. It's got a kind of narrative behind it um, that came from a piece of work that the three of us, Peter, Paul and I, wrote together. Then I'm going to talk very briefly about the five themes that we, that we structured this argument around, which are kind of five pieces of research that form the basis of the catalogue. And then I think where it becomes more interesting is when we had to place that catalogue in four different locations and it kind of fell apart and came back together again in different ways. So the way in which we took this overall narrative, this overall story about finance that we wanted to tell, and plugged it into four or five different locations in the UK, and it produced very different results, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. And at the end, if there's time, I want to show how the exhibition provided us with a resource of re-seeing different things. So we moved from the kind of research we began with to new kinds of research, but just having the, uh, having the exhibition in situation kind of allowed us to think through. Okay, so in 2007 and eight. Um, Peter Paul and I began our, um, began our kind of collab collaboration. We were all talking about finance just before the crisis. Obviously, we were one of those people who were very excited by the crisis. That seemed to know, give us lots of new material. Um, and what we kept saying is that people kept asking us, where's the money gone? I can remember very, very clearly, I just published this book, this, you know, ostensibly about money. People kept saying, where's the money gone? And I was just saying, I couldn't answer that in a simple way, because I was trying to explain that the money had never really been there. But people said, but it was there, it was clearly there, and where's it gone? So that, that was the kind of core of why we put the exhibition together. Where's the money gone? How do we show the money? Where, what, how do we imagine finance? How does culture imagine finance? Because we knew that right from the financial revolution, which is where we begin, that, that um, literary culture and visual culture, which we chose to focus on, had been very, very explicit in trying to imagine and giving us a language and a vocabulary that reoccurs across the centuries for imagining this thing called the market, for imagining these things called money. So we begin the, um, we, we begin the exhibition with William Hogarth, we begin it in 1720, we begin it with the financial revolution. And our overarching thesis, if you like, is we, we, it's very kind of broad and crude, an article that we, we co-wrote, uh, it's in public culture. And what we say is that at the beginning, there's a kind of three moments of imagining finance and that they correspond to three different kinds of aesthetic practices in visual culture. So what we see in the 18th century is we see practices of satire, we see practices of allegory, and we have that notion that finance is threatening, finance is outside of the social order, finance is associated with gambling, finance is associated with new kinds of social actors being allowed into the marketplace, and is therefore disruptive and unruly, and it's kind of grotesque. So what we get in these kind of Hogarth images of the, of the South Sea bubble is something that is kind of grotesque in that moment, as, as finance is being brought in to um, the kinds of legitimacy that we've just been talking about. So it's kind of it's associated with, you know, we've got the devil throwing dice in that image, for example. I mean, that's never good. 
<laughs> That's not what they teach in economics departments. So we move from that to the 19th century when finance is becoming increasingly legitimised, finance is becoming increasingly rational, finance is, the disruption of finance is being tamed. And so then we talk about, um, in what we say that that happens at the same time, is that aesthetic practices themselves are also becoming kind of realist. We've got beginnings of photography, we've got realist art, we've got the, you know, the long 19th century realist novels which can participate in the narrative of finance, the narrative of rationality, the narrative of seeing everything in certain ways, of making everything transparent, and of uh, professionalising this discourse in 19th century art. And Peter's going to talk much more about that. Can you hear me? OK. Um, then in the 20th century, what happened is that as the term, the very kind of broad story that we tell is that art and literature turn towards abstraction, as art and literature turn towards self-referentiality, they tend to be about themselves rather than about the outside world, then similar things were happening in art practices too. Art practices and, you know, the two practices were also becoming interested in the abstract, were also becoming self-referential, being about themselves rather than about the outside world. So the ways in which um, artists now captured finance was by capturing its sense of abstraction, capturing its sense of um, it, it's then the difficulty of imagining it becomes the thing that they represent, if you like. It becomes mystical, it becomes overwhelming, it becomes something that kind of dazzles us. So there's a way in which the, the, way, the things that were happening in finance can be matched very loosely on the things that are happening in the way in which artists responded to them. And we, we kind of, this is really the move from allegory to realist depiction and then to, to abstraction. Um, and as you can see, that's quite a kind of broad story that we're telling there. So we broke it down into five themes. And these five themes are the things that we, the, were the kind of pieces of research, three by the curate, two by the curators and three by the um, academic researchers who were involved in the project. So that's Alistair Robinson um, and Isabella Streffen as well. And this was, if you like, the book catalogue, but it was also our kind of desiderata and what the exhibition in our mind looked like at this point. You have to do the catalogue so far ahead. It was this kind of complicated thing. So the catalogue for the book, and it also tells the stories that we wanted to tell. So the five themes where we told the story of the relationship between debt and credit, framing finance, animal spirits, the money shot, and finally, inevitably, boom and bust. So debt and credit, which I'm going to talk about at the end if I can, debt and credit tells the story of how finance, the, how finance, the kind of the story of debt and credit are basically the same thing. They're just different words for the same thing. And Raymond Williams got this lovely line that we used to call credit debt, but, but, now, we, um, but now we call it credit and we've inverted it by some, in something like that. So what, that, this chapter is really about the ways in which that kind of, there's a kind of dialectic of credit and debt. What do we mean when we say debt? What do we mean when we say credit? And how do we capture the fact that one goes up and one goes down, and hopefully I can talk about that more at the end. So this is an image again from um, 18, 1850. So this chapter on um, framing finance, this is an Andreas Gursky painting of the, it's a photograph rather, of the Chicago Board of Trade. And what you can see is something like kind of pointillism here. You see that it's something that it becomes entirely abstract. What it's representing is lots and lots of people making lots and lots of financial decisions. But the mass of those decisions, the effect of those decisions, becomes something like a kind of impressionist painting. We lose any specificity. We lose the, the detail, the materiality of what they're doing. The very size of it becomes abstract in some way. Um, uh, this, Peter's going to talk about this chapter later on, so I'm going to be kind of brief here, but the animal spirits is thinking about how we have personified the market in order to make it legible to ourselves. So we constantly talk about the market having emotions, the market's depressed, the market's excited, the market's libidinous. You know, often the market's a bit like a kind of teenage girl. The, the, the example that I always give is during the, the, the Greek sovereign debt crisis that someone on Radio 4 said that the market was wondering whether Greece was going to show some leg that day. <laughs> well, uh, uh, just think about that, like a naked, like just Greece, Greece did show lots of leg, it was fine. Um, and I'll come back to way, well, the way in which when we think about the body of the market and we think about the body of money, we often use some kinds of bodies and not other kinds of bodies. When we want to capture that move between rationality and irrationality in the way in which the market moves. Um, the Money Shop is a chapter that's all about the kind of materiality of how we imagine money and the way in which we often imagine money as this kind of intangible thing 
although we hold a tangible thing in our hands, and what artists have played with again and again is that idea of destroying money. The concept of kind of destroying money is a very, um, from the K Foundation onwards, I don't know if you know that word, they burn a million quid, and I teach their video of them talking about burning a million quid, and it's the best teaching I've ever done, because students are just like, some incredibly excited by the idea of seeing a million quid being burnt on this kind of Scottish hillside, and lots of them become incredibly furious at the waste of this. So that idea that money is kind of real, and yet we know it's not real, we know it's the promise beyond it that gives it its reality, so what does it mean, how do we burn it? And this is a very nice piece by um, Geraldine Huraz, in which she kind of, she's got an actual Bitcoin here, she's got a kind of date, she's not got an actual Bitcoin, because of course they're not real, they're immaterial. So she's got a data stick that contains um, the encrypting of a Bitcoin, and she's burning it on a kind of barbecue, like it's a marshmallow, and kind of giggling. So it's a very kind of, um, it's a very kind of parodic of a certain kind of masculine language of finance as well there, and of barbecues too. <laughs> um, the last chapter is Booms and Bust, and this, this image here is The Black Narcissus by the artist Matthew Comfort and David Cross, and this was an original commission for the exhibition. And we're incredibly pleased, because I don't know, the Oxford Handbook of Financial Regulation is now using this as their front image. Um, so there's a kind of nice loop here that everyone who is going to get this kind of formal training in financial regulation will have to look at this image. And what this image is of, it's of, it's just, it's just a still of it, it's actually a video, it's a seven minute video that takes us from 2003 to 2013. Um, and what it shows you is it shows you the financial crisis and how financial crisis recurred constantly throughout that moment, of course, as a series of mountain, um, as, a, as a series of kind of mountain images. Um, and that's very, what's interesting about that is it kind of plays with the notion of the graph, it plays with the notion that we can present this rational material and it means something. Um, one of the things that we had in the exhibition is we had Simon Roberts showing us lots and lots of graphs and none of them had any data on them. So you didn't know which way around to look at them. Because we see that all the time, don't we? Just see those tiny little graphs without any kind of reference points telling us stories. So one of the things we're trying to say is how, do, how are we told these stories about finance and how do we use that language of the graph? And also, how do we use the language of the natural world in order to explain finance all the time? We use the language of, um, we use the language, the very language of boom and bust is one that suggests, you know, green shoots, it suggests toxic waste. We know that we had all these kind of organic metaphors around 2008 onwards, and that they themselves suggested a kind of real, a reality to this crisis or an inevitability of this crisis that we needed to kind of problematise. The other reason that I really like, um, the Confident Cross is because an amazing amount of financial um, adverts, uh, adverts for financial companies, use themselves the image of them as mountain climbers. So you just need to stand in Clapham, um, <coughs> Clapham Tube Station or Clapham Train Railway Station, and you'll see these are massive posters for hedge funds. You know, they're all the ones that you sit on the train. How many of them use the idea of them as the language or the visual image of the financier as being someone who climbs a mountain for us? That idea of risk taking, that idea of excessive masculinity, that idea of control, and of course, you know, peaks of excellence as well. All kinds of things going on in that metal. So that's something else um, that was happening there. Okay, so we took the exhibition to four locations. And um, we took the exhibition to four locations, and they were kind of deliberately chosen as overstating it because we also just had to try and find people who give us funding, find people who give us space. But the first one was deliberately chosen. It was very important for us that it didn't open in London. We had hoped and imagined that it would go to London, um, and it, that, was, that was kind of impossible. But we certainly didn't want it to open in London, and we really wanted it to open in the North East, and we wanted it to open with Alistair Robinson, who is this amazing curator at the NGCA. Um, and why we wanted to, I've got kind of notes from each of the locations. So we, went, we started off in Sunderland, then we went to um, Alton, which is in Hampshire, and to Chawton House Library. We went from there, or at the same time, it was shown across two sites at this point, um, the John Hansard Gallery in Southampton, and now, at the moment, we're still in Manchester, People's History Museum, and we've also got a split site there. Um, we're also at Manchester Business School. Why I've showed the notes here is, A, because they're nice, and um, I like them, and they were the inside of the book. But B, the notes are important because what we wanted to do, to use the locations to do, was to put this very broad 18th century to contemporary history of finance that we constructed in the book within these specific material locations. Because within these material locations, what we find is we find the physical experience of the boom and the bust in a very different way 
to the art, which is often trying to represent the, the whole, or acknowledging that it can't represent the whole. So we were really interested in using the locations and the kinds of buildings we were in um, to explore the materiality of how finance is experienced, which is why it was so important to us that we started in, um, why we started in Sunderland. So I don't know how many of you um, know the NGCA. Yeah. So it's a fantastic gallery. It's got this um, you know, amazing record for doing really, the kinds of contemporary art exhibitions that not many places will do, which we were so naive we didn't realise that. But they all, they'll, use, they'll use historical artefacts, they'll use contemporary art artefacts, they'll use reproductions. They really let us kind of mess up with different kinds of exhibitions, different kinds of things in that same in that same space. It's a massive space as well. Um, so we opened there in June 2014. Um, my mother-in-law was there at the opening and she is a head teacher who is now doing an art history degree. So she's perfect. She was a perfect person to sample the exhibition. She's very literal and very careful. I'm not going to kind of segue into mother-in-law jokes now because they're fundamentally sexist. But um, she calculated at that point that if she read everything in the exhibition, she went back over a period of three days. It would have taken her nine hours to actually focus on it. So it's jam-packed with what we now we realise quickly was too much stuff. Because it's trying to tell these very different kinds of histories that we have here. Um, a ledger from the Barclays archive that's open on Defoe's credits and debts um, with a, a picture by the contemporary artist Justine Smith of, a, of Bermuda made out of Bermuda notes. And at the back we have our, our, our uh, Hogarth. So on the one hand, we've got a, an art gallery that's allowing us to bring together lots and lots of different kinds of things. But the NGCA is also a very specific space. So we're in Sunderland in 2014. It's a place that's experiencing the financial crisis in the way in which London simply isn't experiencing the financial crisis. So we think about it as this kind of London thing. We think about, we think about it as being about banks somehow. But of course, it's not really about banks. I don't know if you saw the article in The Guardian last week that there's a big rise on life coaching people who work in the finance sector because they're feeling increasingly isolated since 2008 because it's very hard being extraordinarily rich. It does make you feel isolated. So that kind of sense of inequality, that sense of massive divisions within the country, it was important that we started well, we, within a stone's throw, as we say, of, um, of Northern Rock. So NGCA is also a really important ex uh, art exhibition because it's in a council building, it's above a library and it's also above a dole office. So we really are bringing, thinking about finance in that space, and we needed to be responsible to that space as well. I'm not sure whether we were. So this is what you see when you go in, and we, that created some kind of friction that we were getting on the feedback. These horrible images by an artist called Imo Klink of the Real Fight Club, these images are called. Imo Klink was, uh, was doing some photography for a Swedish magazine and got back kind of, I don't know, access all areas. Um, to a banking party in which they literally do get really, really pissed and fight each other. And he was able to take these photographs. It's these very kind of mask and violent images, self-images of the, of the financial sector, performing something for itself, as well as for the photographer. And we had that right at the, the bottom of NGCA um, as, you go, as you go in. And you can see you know, the, kind of, the kind of civic structure um, beneath it. But we also, what we, the other thing that we accompanied with that with, which was to try and acknowledge what it meant to be in that place, to be telling that story in that place, is a, um, a series of images, two kinds of series of images of, of Sunderland. So one series of images was of the way in which Sunderland had been imagined by property developers just prior to the crash. And these images are called brilliant things. This is the spirit of Sunderland, and then the other one is called the hallucination, <laughs> which is great, because obviously that's what it was, of the idea of the ways in which Sunderland was going to be redeveloped if that money, if 2008 hadn't occurred. Um, and next to that, we put images of what actually the, the what real estate or whatever you want to call it, what property, what material existence of living in Sunderland at that time was like, which is the kind of angry graffiti that we that you could see um, the, you could see on the streets. So on the one hand, we had our overarching narrative, but then we also tried to kind of um, think about the ways in which other the city being rewritten, if you like, by the crisis, since before the crisis to after the crisis as well. So we moved from here, we moved from the NGCA. What we really wanted to do is, um, we wanted to go to that kind of classic 18th century house. We wanted to go to Mansfield Park, of course, you know, thinking about, I don't know how many, but, you know, the, the, the reading of, the classic reading of Say, Said's reading of Mansfield Park is that it shows us the kind of, the secret history of colonialism that's within the 18th century house. We wanted the idea, we've been reading Ian Bauck, and we wanted to go back to the 18th century, to have an 18th century image here, to think about the origins of this finance too, to think about a very different way to Sunderland. 
So we went to Chawton House Library in Hampshire, which is actually Jane Austen's brother's house, but Jane Austen lived in it and it now has a um, 18th century women's literature library. Very, very different to Sunderland, as you can see. Very different um, experience of being there. Um, and how we, how we related to this space, is we, we related to this space. So here we are in a sort of, you can't, it's, it's a bit of a close up, but we're in a kind of, they've got, you know, they've got these dresses there. It's this kind of house and it does weddings as well as being a library. And it's, you know, it's, it's really playing up its kind of authenticity in all kinds of ways. And what we could do is we could have um, the, the, hello, Bitcoin, the, the burning marshmallow Bitcoin being burnt in an 18th century fireplace, which is obviously very pleasing. Not literally burnt, but it's a, it's a video being burnt in an 18th century fireplace. <laughs> we could use this kind of 18th century dresser that's in the 18th century kitchen that family, the school tours get to go around. And we could put out of this kind of Hogarth and our, uh, our gilways on that. So we could really kind of work with that space. But it also allowed us, which I kind of think we realised as we went along, we didn't know at the beginning, it also allowed us to work with the way in which the debates about money were unfolding over the course of the exhibition. So one of the things that happened, we do, uh, the reason that we managed to persuade Jordan House to let us put all this stuff in there at all was because the year before, and a, the few months before, Mark Carney had gone to Chawton House to announce that Jane Austen was going to be the only, to, to replace Elizabeth Fry as the figure on the £10 note after a massive campaign, I don't remember, by Caroline Credo Perez, kind of Twitter campaign. So we got Caroline Credo Perez down as well. So we could talk about the materiality of money within Jane Austen's house and again, make think about these specific histories. The other reason it was great to be in Jane, Orton, Jane Austen's house in Chawton is because Jane Austen's brother had been a banker who had, surprise, surprise, lost the £13 that Jane Austen made in Mansfield Park in a financial crisis. He'd not only lost the £13 that Austen had made on Mansfield Park, he also lost most of the money for the village. So that note, if I just flick back, of, um, of, Alton, Ch of Alton Bank, the, 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 the copy that we had in the exhibition at the time is signed, I just couldn't find it last night, is signed by Jane Austen's brother. So it's sense in which that history then, Austenites are a peculiar a peculiar loyal brand. But we could bring out this new kind of research. We had people doing new research that was really mapping the way in which Austen herself had been involved in and commented upon uh, speculation. So people reenacting a board game of speculation around all these other board games. Um, speculate as, as a board game that she, a card game that she talks about. Um, so we could kind of bring out that history. Piketty's book was also being talked about that summer, you remember. It was only last year. And Piketty uses Austen so much to think about both the way in which we're returning to 18th century economics, but also the way in which literature allows us to imagine these things in the way nothing else could. So there was a really kind of nice synergy of taking this and putting it, um, and putting it there. We went from there to Southampton uh, John Hansard Gallery, which is a, on a university campus. Um, it's a much more kind of traditional white cube kind of space. It's a kind of, and we had a very kind of minimal paired back exhibition there, so it was a different exhibition again, you can see it looks very kind of different. And what we could talk about there was we could talk about the, we could talk about the offshore. Southampton is a kind of, we're talking about David Harvey, we're talking about globalisation, Southampton is an offshore city in lots of ways now. It's a city that's been containerised, its whole identity has changed because of the way uh, containers have functioned in that city. And so we could talk about, we could talk about the offshore. So this is a piece by Golden Plus Senebi. Um, called The Reading Room, which is part of their headless exhibition, which is a way of imagining, um, is imagining how we can represent the offshore and how can fiction represent the offshore. So we could, we could do lots of kind of, obviously that I'm in Southampton, so we could do lots of kind of literary things around that too, that concept of the reading room and how does it work in different kinds of literary genres as well. Um, the piece on the floor um, is made up of lottery tickets all sewn together. That, um, Rhiannon Williams, I can't think of her name. Rhiannon Williams, um, uh, the artist, you can see, can you see most of them are kind of white on this image, but a few of them are just darkened out. The ones that are darkened out are the ones that she won money on, so she reverses them, and then she's attached them all to give them some kind of solidity. It's a very fragile thing, it's made from lottery tickets. She ties them all, she's sewn them all onto birthday cards. It's a very nice way of kind of, again, to have that next to the Imo Plink. Um, is what's going on here. So we're kind of feminising these different kinds of gambling, the different kinds of materiality, different kinds of monies being circulating at the same time. Um, so the final location where we opened this July, um, and there's Peter talking to it, is uh, the People's History Museum in Manchester, where it is, you'll all be very pleased to know, still there. A smaller version, slightly, but and a slightly different version again. So going to the People's History Museum was allowed us to 
to think about the kind of the politics of class in terms of finance again to talk about you know the, the, the people's history music to draw on their archives as a museum um, in different ways um, and we also this is an image from the opening night in which we had a uh, there's a brilliant piece of theatre called Money the Game Show, which is kind of trying to, it's a kind of pedagogical piece and it's trying to explain crisis. It's trying to explain the financial crisis through these different kinds of narratives. But what's really, really brilliant about it is that they have £10,000 in quid coins and they spill them on the stage and then they get people to throw them at each other. That was a nice way to think about the materiality of money as well because people really like seeing. Is it it's 10,000? Is it, yeah, that's, that's 10,000 pounds. That's 10, that, that, that pathetic little pile. Not very much. Pounds. It's really shockingly not much. It makes a kind of good noise. No, we do it. Yeah, we can't do it because it's all about this piece, actually. So you can see it fills those two buckets and, and it gets thrown into these two buckets in a series of games. But what the piece is actually about is the security guards you have to pay for to come with the piece. There's a kind of, there's a kind of, another, uh, there's a, another drama behind it, which is actually much more fascinating, is how do you keep that money secure? And everyone's spending the whole time thinking, how will they know it all goes back? And they kind of bounce everywhere because they literally do make them play these kind of games with it. Um, so that was, that was kind of good to have because what we're trying to do in Manchester is be much more, we were in quite uh, discreet, specific locations before. Manchester's our kind of biggest, has got our biggest footfall and we tried to speak to that more on our opening night too. And so we got Stephanie Flanders to literally walk over the money, which is very exciting. And, and we wanted to photograph her standing on the money, but she's quite sensitive apparently since she's changed sectors. She didn't want us to do that, her just standing on the money. But she was very, you know, she's great because she could talk about... She could talk about Greece, which is what she mainly talked about that night, and you know, her, as it was unraveling, and her opinion of it as it was unraveling, and that again we could, uh, in each location we could, we had some Greek. Some, I don't know if you've seen this before, but these are euros that are being um, modified by the artist Stefan, and that they. Um, so on this one here, you've got death underneath the euro, and that they're being put back into circulation. It's kind of participating in this very long tradition. Of, of annotating notes and then putting them back in circulation. So we could put those, they would just be come out that time, we could include those um, in the exhibition as that sense in which we could carry on having conversations about conversations as we went through it. And we could also use Manchester's own collection. Um, so what we have here is we have the image of a, um, a landlord as a pig, which, um, which was a kind of 1920s piece, 1930s piece. They, it, they're not quite sure, are they? Because it, it was used... 1920s. 1920s. And it was used as a kind of piece of election propaganda. But it speaks to that kind of the iconography that we've got elsewhere, which is having this kind of the fat cat, the animalistic, uh, um, animalistic financier, is there um, in, in, the, in uh, Manchester's own collection as well. So again, the sense of that, that local history being there. I just wanted to give, can I, yeah, I'm just going to, yeah, fine, I'm just going to carry on. I never get to talk for this long unless, you know, I'm giving a lecture, so it's quite exciting. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is, is talk a little bit about uh, the way in which after the exhibition was rolling, I, I was asked to, to talk in lots of situations about money, um, the materiality of money, and I don't know why they picked me and not Paul or Peter, but to talk about gender in those contexts too. And so I began to kind of reassess the way in which what the exhibition that we'd put together told us about gender. Um, and I'm just going to kind of tell that story here. I'm going to give you three minutes, three moments um, of thinking about how money is made. So we were talking about positive money um, just now, and we were saying, can, obviously, the Bank of England isn't the only people who make money, that we know that money is made in these other ways. So one of the things I do when I give a talk about the exhibition is I explain how money is made in these, in these other ways and how... They, how um, we imagine it, how we give it a kind of cultural imaginary that makes us understand what appears to be quite abstract and appears to be quite difficult. So I begin, of course, again, where the exhibition begins with the financial revolution. Um, with the image, this is the last image from um, William Hogarth's A Rake's Progress, in which Tom, the poor, poor, gullish, um, credible Tom, ends up in debtor's prison. And he's kind of abject at that point, and he's thrown off his mistress, he's thrown off his wife, He's lost his father's money, um, and he's gone mad. He's, he, he kind of goes to bedlam. But what we see on the wall here, you can, you can see, and I mean, Hogarth did different versions of this. As, as you'll know, he's a, an engraved and kind of kept changing his work. What we see here is we see an image of a coin. We see an image of Britannia. We see that date 1763. But we see behind it, we see an image for, of the skies. We see an image of um, astronomy. 
And the note in his hand, that we can't see very well, says that it talks about a, a mad plan to pay off the nation's debt. So in this image, which is also 1720, what happened in 1720, I'm not, I'm going to, you know, we, what happened in 1720 is the South Sea bubble, but the beginning of the financial revolution, what we think of as the beginning of the financial revolution, was a way in which the state, the founding of the Bank of England, the way in which the, the state created paper money. Okay, and then the state creates paper money, then that creates immediately lots and lots of anxieties about can we trust the state? Can we trust everybody else? Are they going to inflate away this money? Is there going to be counterfeiting? Are they going to be despotic and go to war with this money? Yes, they are. They really are. That's the history of paper money. And that's, the, that's the David Graeber story. It's the history of war. Um, so what we see in the financial revolution, this moment of the state making money, is we see an anxiety about debt and credit in the same image, which is what's really important. So our language of debt from Hogarth and from Dickens and is the language of shame. Margaret Atwood says, uh, she's got this fantastic book about debt, the novelist Margaret Atwood, she talks about you get into debt or you flounder in debt, you sink into debt. De debt is, is a ship that's sinking, debt is a quagmire. But the language for debt is a debased language, it's a guilty language, it's a shameful language, it's a sort of subterranean language. We've got to get out of debt, haven't we, to lift ourselves up. The language for credit, which as I said at the beginning, which is the same thing, of course, credit and debt are the same thing, the language for credit is the opposite. The language for credit is the language of escape, is the language of flight, is the language of movement. It's our spatial fix. That's what credit gives us. It allows us to move into the future and not worry, or, or, um, and our temporal fix in particular. Um, it allows us to move into the, into the future and not worry about that. We're going to push all that down the road. That's someone else's problem. Because it's escape. It's pleasurable. So what, what we see here, right in the beginning of the financial revolution, the beginning of this moment of paper, uh, paper money, is we see both languages being put together. We see a kind of ambivalence there. We have flight, we have escape, and we have madness, debasement at the same time. We have debt and we have credit. And we have them, um, we see them in the other images. So the image I showed at the beginning is a similar thing again. And what we have here is we have the image of, um, it's called William Pitt, the, sink, the national parachute um, John Bull conducted to plenty of emancipation. At the top, so the, 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 the basket in which they're in is the sinking fund, and the sinking fund is an amount of money that's set aside to pay the national debt. But you can see that the sinking fund itself is being kept afloat by the national debt. So that'll work. <laughs> that'll work. So there's a, the way, again, again, that kind of paradox of debt and credit, the way in which they are the same thing, but we give them these different languages, are there. And this image, so this is a kind of early image of the balloon. Because balloons were about 20 years old at this time, it's still quite a relatively kind of mass phenomena. So we can see that. So that image of flight is really important to credit. And in the financial revolution, what we acknowledge is it's a paradoxical image of flight. That's what I'm saying here. It's an image of flight that contains that moment of abasement within it. Um, we move on then. I've got that there because I've been writing about it, but I might not be able to have time to talk about it. But um, what we move on, on to here is we move on to the second moment I want to talk about, the moment of paper money. The second moment in which money was made, or another in incredibly important way in which money was made, was when money was made not by the state, but money was made by the consumer industry, by credit industry. And this is another kind of financial revolution. Financial revolution that happened in, uh, it was in America initially in the kind of early 1920s when it was began. And what happened is that people could take private credit, stores could take private credit, but, and they could sell that credit on. They could financialize that credit. So as soon as you've got your private credit and you can turn that credit not into a debt, it's not a debt anymore, you can turn it into an asset by selling it, by financializing it, you've produced money. That's what you've done. And so places like um, Sears and Roebuck, um, you know, really kind of led the, led the way in which uh, they wanted people to carry on buying things. They didn't know how to make them buy them, but because their credit, credit was really bad, if it was personal credit, you know, that was no good. You had, to, you had to hold the risk. You don't want to hold the risk. You want to sell the risk on. As soon as you can sell the risk on, then there's a way of making money there. And that's the kind of credit money is being made to consumer credit in America in the 1910s and 1920s. Wizard of Oz, book in 1900. Baum was a very, very bad shopkeeper. He was like a very bad wizard. He's a shopkeeper who kept going bankrupt because he kept giving people credit. Um, there's a kind of a long way in which this book is often read as being about the bimetallism debate in America. It's often the, the yellow brick road is gold. They're on the way to land of Oz, which is an ounce of gold. Her shoes are really silver, not red, uh, in, the, in the original book. And that's what kind of is often used. It's used in economics pedagogically as well, I think, to, to, to explain the bimetallism debate in America. 
And really, I think this book is about credit. He's a balloonist again. And what we've got in the Emerald City is we've got the creation of a kind of consumer economy. And what's really interesting about that for me is that the Emerald City is really the white city in Chicago. It's the World Fair of 1893. The money that was, the money that was made from that, from the concession store, became fed into Sears Roebuck, and credit money came from that moment. There's a long kind of condensed history there, but I think we can see the ways in which um, credit money was being made in the 1920s in our visual language for it. And our visual language is often one that, again, you see the postcard from 1925, we can think of here as Amelia Earhart, the idea of, you know, of, of, of flappers, <coughs> of women are somehow being associated with the freedom that money creates, money simply buys, this new credit that was very kind of early when Baum was writing is, seems to be everywhere in 1925. It's feeding into a certain kind of other changes in, in our uh, sexual economy. It's feeding into uh, the kind of first wave women's movement. And, we're, and that excitement of credit, that escape that credit produces is associated with femininity in this period. Right up until the 1950s, this is one of the first um, savings account that was for women. Um, so one of the things that we did for the exhibition is that I did some research in Lloyd's and Peter did some research in Barclays about the ways in which uh, personal finance had been advertised. And you can see again that the idea of a woman, I mean there are lots and lots of these women, they're not fully clothed. So there's this one, there's also, there's also a ballerina and there's also a trapeze artist in this, in this triptych. And they're absolutely kind of beautiful 1950s images. But they are that idea that when women can have her own money, what's she going to do? She's going to go water ski with it, damn it. She's going to take her clothes off and go and put a little bikini on. Because um, she's keeping a good balance there. So it's actually a savings account, but it's still got that kind of promise of, um, of escape that credit always offers us. And these are my favourite images in the exhibition. So when we got that kind of credit money, that money that's uh, uh, created through the consumer credit industry really took off with credit cards rather than store credit in the 60s and 70s. And these are some images um, that Peter found in Barclays, which take that image, that kind of erotic, keep that image in your mind, keep that image in your mind. Now, think about Britain in the early 1970s, and you get that. <laughs> you get, so you have this image of these, we were called the Barclay Card Girls, it was the Barclay Gar Gar Card Girls campaign, when they would go and they would explain, um, they would explain how credit cards worked, how you'd get your, how you'd get your score rating, you know, it's very kind of early, um, notions of, of kind of individual personal risk assessment, and they dressed them like airline stewards. Not only did they do that, but they had a, a rolling campaign. They got in a caravan. <laughs> what? Some, it's the most glamorous image of flight I've ever seen. <laughs> Apart from this, oh no, I haven't got it. There's a bus. There's a double-decker bus that's also in the bar car delivery. It's got the girls standing outside, and they don't look like girls. Um, so that idea of of, of credit being, so this kind of credit that emerged in the 20th century was really feminised because of course it was women doing the spending and it was also threatening because women were doing the spending. Um, so lots of the kind of adverts, a wife deserves some credit for example, again this is from, um, it's from the 70s, the idea was what we discovered in the Lloyd's archive are these adverts that are really from kind of late, to, mid 20th century and a woman looking up and saying I really don't need my husband's signature and being really kind of, and really pleased and shocked that she could borrow money on her own accord. But credit cards were also ways of controlling women as well, as controlling their spending, of making their spending visible within the household economy. So they were very, very kind of threatening things in the way in which the history of debt this has been, this has been written about. Um, so already one in man in 21 has a different kind of spending power. I've got no idea what's going on with that image. <laughs> I will leave that. And we can see the same, I mean, I'm not going to talk about that, but we can see the same kind of iconography. This is a film that came out right at the moment of the bus. Those of you with children, small children at that age will remember. Um, and it's clear, you know, it's a house being lifted by balloons that pop. It's the story of the Wizard of Oz as well in the story. It's the same story that we can trace right back from Hogarth. The difference is, you know, my big punchline for all of these images, the big difference is that what we get in the Hogarth and we get in the Gilway is we get a memory of the debt. We get poor Tom's sodden body there. We get the balloon that's the contradiction of the credit and debt in that single image. In the late 20th century, even after the crisis, or during the crisis, our imagery for, um, our imagery did not show, so the Lloyd's advert I love because it looked so much like Up and it's got another hot air balloon. Um, and then the Barclay Card water slide. So these images ran through the crisis. These images, and so there's that kind of odd moment that lots of you will remember where you'd be looking at adverts on the telly during the crisis thinking, that bank doesn't exist anymore. That's gone. I don't know, but you know, they've bought the advertising space, so they're just going to carry on running it out. And you see these kind of hoardings. But what, what we get here is we get what, um, 
Ole Berg calls post-credit money. So this is different to the credit money of the consumer money. This is the money created by the financial institution for the financial institutions. It's the money from derivatives. It's the money that has no referentiality at all beyond itself, which is that kind of question, where did the money go? It wasn't really there for anyone at all. It was a money that was created by these financial institutions that just spoke to their own future value. It was self-referential. But what we see in the advertising image is that exactly idea. So the water slide, what I love about the Barclay Card water slide, it's not going anywhere. It's like the money of the financial crisis. It's just trickling really fast around the city. And what's bizarre about it is that that was the thing that would make you want a credit card. Like these are adverts, remember, as well. Um, so there was this kind of weird moment in which that history seemed to come together and we sort of have that that language, the same language operating, but what we don't have here is we don't have any sense of the debt, we don't have any sense of that dialectic, we don't have any sense of the contradiction that debt involves. There's no, there's the crisis that the spatial fix will always produce is not here, or the, the temporal fix. Finally, back to the exhibition, I'm going to end now two pieces. This is a piece by the artist Thomas Gokey. Gokey is very involved in the, um, in the debt jubilee movement in the States, in the Occupy Debt, and um, what we can see behind him, sorry, um, this is, oh no, okay. I've got to go back. The piece, of, the work is called forty nine thousand nine hundred eighty three dollars. The total amount of money rendered in exchange for a master's of fine arts degree to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, comma pulp. So what Goki did is he went um, to the Federal Reserve. He got used dollars. He got exactly four thousand nine hundred eighty three used dollars, and he made paper mache out of them. Um, and it's in the exhibition. And it's quite ugly. It's made, it's paper mache is slightly green, not as green as you'd think. Um, and what he does is that he sells, he cuts up the pieces and he sells the pieces and when all the pieces are sold, he will have made, obviously, $49,983. So he's literalised that notion that, uh, that a degree is somehow a debt or a degree is a credit. He's financialised himself by turning his art literally into a piece of work um, and they're up there. And then so it's part of that and I like this because he's kind of... Um, Again, playing with that language of credit. There's something very crude and rough and cheap about $49,982 when they've been turned into paper mache. Um, and the art piece is very crude, and yet his image of himself is him kind of flying over it because he's found a way of extending it. He's turned it into credit. He's financialised himself. Then the last image um, I want to show is from Molly Crabapple Debt and Her Debtors. And this is nice because... Um, it, it was a massive, massive oil, oil painting that gave the exhibition a very different kind of aesthetic piece. Um, it's owned by a US senator who we had to kind of crawl and plead to be allowed to get it, um, to, to bring it over. Um, and I'm ending with it because it ends where we start. It goes back to the kind of tradition, the allegorical tradition of Hogarth, if you like. It goes back to the, the Gilrays, which I showed you little bits of in the uh, Chawton House, in Chawton House Library. And that what we have is we have the bubbles popping, the bubbles are associated with America. And you can see on one side, we have the mice, the workers, climbing up the ladder, climbing up the ladder of debt, and then being turned by, it's not a subtle piece, and then being turned by the fat cats into gold coins at the bottom. And there's a way in which kind of crab apples kind of gave us a visual language that summarised lots and lots of the exhibition. Right, thank you. That was wonderful, fascinating. Um, do people have questions for Nikki? Yes. And for Peter. And for Peter, and for Peter. if you'd like to join us. Come well. here, the That's other. great, thanks. Really um, interesting to see all the sort of diverse approaches to um, artists representing finance. I was just thinking during it, um, it's probably outside of the remit of maybe the research for it, but artists or artist groups that have. Um, maybe looked at alternative forms of economy as well and sort of producing, so um, there's, I forget who the artist is who studied for, it was in documents this year, but the sort of movement for a time bank, uh, uh, okay. the artists are representing, actually we set up in Leeds, the Leeds Creative Time Bank, uh, which was the sort of artistic community coming together to sort of explore alternative economies and superflex that have, have done sort of with Let's as well. Um, and I was also thinking during that about sort of more the actual sort of artist-led scene or the community yeah. of kind of artist spaces that are existing outside of public funding um, or the commercial art scene, how they actually operate with the more sort of informal economy yeah. or a different sort of economy as well. That's kind of so it, it just yeah, moving that idea of what artists do away from purely representation of what, what yeah. what's happening into a sort of more uh, 
yeah, area of active agency and whether that either was part of this exhibition or could have been part of it or could be part of future iterations? It, um, I mean, it's part of our, the way in which we write about art because, of course, art is, as I discovered recently, an asset class now. It's kind of literally an asset class. It's literally a speculative vehicle in and of itself. Um, so when we know that kind of self-consciousness about these things that you know appear to be critical in some ways, but are also, you know, if the Molly Crab Apple. If we tried to get that about eight months earlier, we could have just bought it for the amount it cost us to bring it over after she'd been kind of dubbed, you know, the you know the artist of Occupy, and suddenly she, you know, a mama bought her work and it changed entirely. We did it, the the thing I didn't talk about in Sunderland. One of the ways in which we talked about those different kinds of economies that we were trying to think about is that we had an artist round table when artists were explicitly talking about that, and that what was interesting. To me, I mean, I, you know, I work in the English department. Is that there's this kind of what, this very different kinds of relationships that artists had to each other. So those who were represented by a gallery um, and could sell their art had a really different status within that community to those who didn't do that and had no interest in doing that. And you know, and that you could see that just in the way in which we had to curate their work and where we put their work and how you know all those sort of things went on. So we had a, we had a superflex, um, the superflex piece. Do you know that we must not talk about recession. Which is a, it's a kind of, um, it was a, in Dublin in 2009 that they, uh, they instigated a kind of a bylaw for the day working with, and I can't remember what structure it was, I think it was a local authority, in which no one in Dublin must say the word recession for the day. Um, because if it's just a state of mind, we can kind of talk it away by not talking it anymore. So it was a kind of, it was a, it was a nice piece. But we, the artists that we had who were outside of that kind of either gallery space or the state funding space, we had Robin Batachira. He's got his own currency, um, so that was, and that currency is a kind of, is a literal currency because if you got in early and you bought some of those, then they're, they're worth something. But he's carried on producing them now; they're not. And the, the, there's a, he's got, a, they're constantly being traded, and there's a kind of exchange for them. So yeah, we had that conversation at the beginning, and we were aware of that. And we were working with an artist, Isabella Streffen, so it's part of it, but not. How did you find the audiences change between, say, Sunderland and the other three locations? Um, what, we, is, what we did is we did lots of different kinds. I don't think I could... I think I would just fall into very broad generalisations. I mean, and what we haven't done yet is a proper analysis of... We, had a, we have a board in each place that people put comments up. Um, and we have a website that's got a competition and an app, you know, it sings and dances this, this, this piece. And we haven't done a proper analysis of that, of those comments. So I, I'm, I'm, I've kind of looked at the NGCA comments and that's why I've kind of got the friction from where we're in Sunderland that just saying, you know, that this is just inappropriate for, for this place at this moment. Um, we weren't getting that. In, you know, in Chorton in Hampshire, we were talking to ladies who lunch. And they thought it was, I mean, I literally gave an evening meet, to meet the curator talk. I mean, it's just generalisations, but it's kind of fun. I did a, a kind of evening meet the curator there when I was in Chorton, and they were literally going on to talk about how they manage their tax. Like, no, no. <laughs> and their children who work in the city, like, that's not, that's not what you're meant to be getting from this. So, yeah, we were talking, knowingly talking to different kinds of, uh, different kinds of constituencies, but we haven't done any proper analysis of that yet. But it'll be interesting. Um, this is a, a, an observation really. I went to see the exhibition at the People's History Museum in Manchester and uh, in terms of the context of the People's History Museum, mm. I, I imagine a few people have been to it but, and, and so we'll know this, but it's located in this entirely privately owned, massively corporate centre of Manchester that's piece, recently yeah. been called. Everything in Manchester has to be up the north at the moment. Um, the Canary Wharf up the north. No, and that rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, you go in it and it, fe it feels like... Um, a sort of an insurgent space <laughs> in many yeah. ways the People's History Museum that's been a kind of concession granted by this huge organisation allied London that own this this legally and financially driven sector of the city section of the city I should say. Yeah, no that's true, that's nice. We could have done I mean we we'd have to get sponsorship from the People's History Museum's neighbours or those banks um, around them and couldn't couldn't get anything out of it. Although ironically all the bankers go and have their lunch in the cafe of the museum at lunchtime, but I'm not sure if they then have gone into the exhibition. Yeah, they do go into it. And they change their minds, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I'm dead, aren't you? Okay. Well, should we say thank you again to Nikki and to Peter? For <laughs>